Okay. Are we wanting to wait a moment here? Do we think we've got enough folks in the room? Oh, why don't we just officially wait a moment till it's okay. officially nine? All right. It looks like Tommy says he keeps getting kicked off here. Well, I mean, Tommy, you, you, you got to make sure you've got exact change for the bus. Yeah, right. So, uh, um, no, see, I've never gotten kicked off, but then I'm, you know, Tommy's probably on his phone. He may be. I know that um, I seem to have better luck when I've actually loaded the uh, Discord software versus going through the web page because it saves all my stuff, like my passwords and things. Oh, yeah. No, he says no, he's not. Oh, he's on his laptop. Huh. Oh, okay, well, fingers crossed for you. We'll see if we can get another person or two in here. I I messaged Crone through uh, Discord because she's yeah. known to, to linger. But uh, we'll we'll see if she comes out of the shadows tonight. Good, good, good. Do, do, do. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, just a reminder: uh, DJ's all uh, suited up uh, on YouTube. If you want to check that out. Looking very, you know, you you look like a White House page boy or something like that, DJ. I know, and I I uh, even dressed for the occasion because I'm wearing a very bipartisan tie. Oh, oh, I see. Now, tell me why it's a bipartisan tie. Well, um, as uh, history tells us, the the uh, the Republicans tend to favor a red tie, and Democrats tend to favor a blue. So, of course, you you know, you watch the election maps and they paint the states based upon how many votes are coming in for the candidates. Well, mm -hmm. purple is often used as a, a term for uh, in a neutral ground. It's a common ground where the two come together. So red and blue makes purple. OK, very clever. Very clever. I think it's purple. I mean, I am male, so we have a tendency to be colorblind. <laughs> Right. <laughs> hey, hey, boys! Why don't you get this thing started? I got places to go, man. That's wow. Cool. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, it looks like Crone showed up, so let's start this. Good evening. It's a very exciting night here at the Marionette Theater. We're gonna try to get all the counting done. We've been doing it for days. Yeah. Hey, grab your seats. The show will begin. In just a moment, folks. Good evening. How are you, Mr. Smelly? Well, I'm fine. Uh, I, 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 I'm not on as many pins and needles as I was over the last couple of days because things have sort of calmed down uh, with the election here as we record this tonight. Um, what is it? Just uh, three days after the election, DJ? Oh, yes. And the counting still continues. Yeah. So that's where we are now. So what, if you're hearing this as, a, you know, a little bit later on uh as a podcast uh, that's where we are right now as a matter of fact it's friday night and we're starting uh as we always do at 9 p.m eastern time so if uh you want to join us live like some of the folks here have done uh just uh, find us uh on univaz and uh follow the instructions and and uh, see us live. It's very exciting. Now, Toppy, speaking of the election, did you have a very long wait when you went to vote? Not at all. Um, I guess I was expecting it because that was the story in a lot of places. But um, I went early and uh, there was no line at all where, it, you know, this is a... Uh, Peckelhow is a pretty small town, so you're not going to have lines like perhaps 
uh, not quite Apple Country <laughs> or some of some of the other towns. So, uh, but I I did expect something of a line, and there wasn't. So uh, I had no problem whatsoever. Ooh. It was in and out. Ah, uh, well, our plans kind of backfired on us because we decided to do the early voting that we've had for the first time here in New York State. And, uh, well, the first day we went, the line was so long that we left, came back in an hour, and it was still too long. So we tried the next day, and thankfully we decided to stay put this time. We only waited a little bit over an hour, but I do hear tell that the uh, mayor of New York City waited three and a half hours and had pizza delivered to the line. Ha. Well, that's nice. Um, I, I take it that he, he had pizza delivered not just to himself, but to, to others. So, well, so. you know, we, we are in a pandemic, so I hope he wasn't sharing his pizza. Oh, I don't know. Okay, maybe it was just for himself. Then. <laughs> but uh, Well, you know, I, I, I would assume that he probably had other boxes delivered, too. But, yeah. So, um, our senior showgirl has been waiting with baby yeah. Beth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering there, Missy, could you yeah. do me a little favor, if you would? Sure. Uh, could you tell that mister of yours, that new beau that we, we heard about so much in the beginning of the season, could you tell him to stop calling the box office? Because uh, oh. he's left you a few messages and... Um, well, it's just not appropriate. Uh, oh, uh, about that. See, I've been a little hesitant to actually give him my own phone number. So I gave him the box office number. Um, okay, well, maybe I'll fix that. Sorry. Okay, well, if you'll get yourself downstairs there, Miss, uh, we need to get this show on the road. Okay, I've been waiting. Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Gertie. Uh, there she goes. <laughs> Presidents Kramer and Douglas were once opponents on the campaign trail, but their public service has kept them running into each other in social circles. One is a ladies' man, the other a devoted husband. Find out what happens when the two are framed for a scandal that threatens to do more than just keep them out of the public eye. Grab a trench coat and some dark glasses. It's time for Jack Lemon and James Garner in My Fellow Americans. Hit it, boys! What do you get when you take a dash of the silver screen, a pinch of golden oldies, and a smidgen of screaming? It's time for Matinee Minutia with your host, DJ and Tommy. Well now, so this is a mid to late 90s adventure comedy and as our senior showgirl let you know, it involves some former presidents. And, you know, as it's, it's, uh, history has shown us, uh, sometimes after they leave the office, they can be buddy-buddy, especially if it means raising some money for charity. Well, that can happen. Um, I think classy presidents play it that way. <laughs> now, I don't know. Should we say, could we uh, conjecture perhaps sometime down the road whether or not trump wins or loses do you think do you think he'll be one of those classy presidents who plays nicely with others oh goodness well <laughs> i i uh i uh, beg to differ because i mean uh you know as it is um well <laughs> <laughs> it's too early to say, but it's too uh, early. To say. It, it, it was it was nice to see, you know, uh, past presidents coming together, especially the the Bushes and the Obamas, and mm -hmm. you know, you can always accomplish some good when you uh, you make uh, uh, nice. <laughs> well, maybe Trump will uh, try his hand at uh, building houses like oh, President, President Carter. Carter. I don't know. Maybe he could. He might. I, I hear that one of his former properties in the Pacific Northwest has actually been turned into 
community housing for immigrants. <laughs> oh, no, not with not not because he wanted it that way. I'm sure. Oh no, former properties. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> well, DJ, um, do we have a trailer for this thing? We sure do. Lay it. Let her rip. Jack Lemon is ex-president Kramer. Yeah. So a message from the president. Oh, thanks, Jim. Jim's off today, sir. I'm Bruce. Oh, sorry. You and Jim look very much alike. Jim's black, sir. Yeah, I know, but you're both <laughs> tall. James Garner is ex-president Douglas. I can't believe I just did it with Matt Douglas. My mother has a commemorative plate with your face on it. Apparently, I'm dishwasher safe. Dan Aykroyd is current president Amy. Not so fast, Carl. Slow down. Oh, I don't like people running faster than I do. It makes me look pokey. Kramer and Douglas always ran against each other. Let's talk about popularity. There was only one assassination attempt on me. You had three. Two. The woman in Phoenix doesn't count. You don't have a starter pistol. Stop. Mm -hmm. But now... Mr. President, I'm afraid a situation's come up. Here it is. They've discovered a cover-up. We've had that buried for years. Of presidential proportions. Somebody wants us dead. When they find out we're not, they're going to come looking for us. And they're running together. One, two, three. God, that felt good. We'll go public. Without evidence, the people will believe us. Why? Because we're presidents. Okay, they won't believe us. Let's stop talking. We're about to bomb. It'll make me vomit. Jack Lemon. I was Time Magazine's man of the year. So was Hitler. Not twice. Shoot him! James Garner. Give me a sip. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm about to share my coffee with the Washington love machine. You can spit in a Petri dish and start a whole new civilization. Dan Aykroyd. Vice President Matthews going to this thing? Yes, sir. Well, let's remind him that these people are from the Netherlands, not the nether regions. John Hurd as the vice president. <laughs> and Lauren Bacall. It's a crock, and we both know it. It's a kick in the... Sorry, sweetheart. Please, I'm a politician's wife. I have a set of my own. In a story about life, liberty, and the pursuit of two presidents. Over there! Just blend in. Just blend in. This is amazing. Not really. We march these things all the time. What are you doing here? Are you coming out? No, no, I'm not coming out. He is. Oh, my God. He squeezed my breast again. My fellow Americans. I'm hot. <laughs> <laughs> there you go now i don't think these two have appeared in a movie together before james garner and, um, and Jack yeah i don't think they have i think this may have been a first i think so and we'll uh we'll actually explore that a little further later on there uh, was somebody else originally intended for this but i was actually pleasantly surprised and i was glad that james garner was cast in this role because uh, i think they had some very good um you know kind of uh uh um what do you call it uh well, a rapport they they, a rapport. Bounce, they bounced off of each other well yeah so, Toppy, um, this film came out in 1996. Right. So, tell us what was going on in the world in 96. It was a long time ago. <laughs> well, the U.S. history in 1996. And this is uh, just the positive stuff, folks. There's been enough negative in the world this year. So, Gary Kasparov beat... Uh, Deep Blue, we, uh, a computer, a chess computer in the second chess match. The Hoover Institution releases an optimistic report that global warming will probably reduce mortality in the United States and provide Americans with valuable benefits. Huh? <laughs> global warming will probably reduce death rates. I, I, I heard. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, you know they like to spin things there. Uh, the last fourth generation Chevrolet Corvette. You know the uh, the hatchbacks. Uh -huh. It rolled off the assembly line at the GM assembly plant in Bowling Green, Kentucky, in '96. So no more Corvettes. Hmm. Uh, in '96, Nintendo released the their third console. It was the Nintendo 64 in North America. The popular children's TV series Arthur debuted on PBS Kids. 
And also in 96, in the science and space realm, the STS-80 Space Shuttle Columbia conducted the longest mission of the space shuttle program at its time. Hmm. And a little bit of a history from uh, classic films and whatnot, heyday. The Sands Hotel in Las Vegas is imploded to make way for today's Venetian Hotel. Oh, all right. General Motors EV1, like Echo Victor 1, the first production electric car, the modern era. Oh, my God. Way back then? Yes, it's launched and became available for lease. Hmm. And a few other things in 96. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, made very famous by a Judy Garland film called The The Harvey Girls, Hmm. uh, Railway merged with Burlington Northern Railroad to form the BNSF Railway. I remember when they took the golden uh, stake and drove it into the ground. Oh, or maybe that was another time. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> this made it one of the largest railroad mergers in U.S. history at the time in 96. Uh-huh. And then rounding out 96, another event from the, the realm of the Rat Pack in Vegas, the Hacienda Resort on the Las Vegas Strip is imploded. Made it mean that it went boomy. Uh, right. Made way for Mandalay Bay, which I think has that very famous pirate adventure ride. Okay. All right. I believe you. So 93. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. 96. Uh, we saw some celebrities pass away. These are big ones. So uh uh, for, uh, number one, Gene Kelly, he was 83, passed away. Famous singer, actor, dancer, choreographer, and director. Audrey Meadows, known primarily for uh, the Jackie Gleason show, The Honeymooners. She was 73. George Burns, by God, he passed away at age 100. People thought he was going to live forever. I know I did. Ella Fitzgerald, she was 79, African-American jazz singer. Uh, Classic film actress, Claudette Colbert, she was 92. And I love this description. (laughs) This made me laugh, DJ, when I read this. Tupac Shakur, uh, who was 25, that his description is rapper and murder victim. Oh, gee, I couldn't get over that. He was a pretty. Oh, Lord. So I'm you need, sorry. That's now, true. only a side tangent on the uh, Tupac Shakur thing, Toppy. You may not be aware, but, uh, you know, all those concerts that have been made popular by laser light shows and the virtual reality kind of holograms. Yeah. That all started after the death of Tupac. In fact, <clears throat> uh, his likeness was one of the first used as a hologram in a concert. Okay. All right. By the way, I'm I'm not laughing at his uh, assassination. <laughs> I I just found it here. Anyways, Dorothy Labor was 81. She passed away that year. A famous film actress, and uh, primarily known for his roles on Star Trek. Across the years, Mark Leonard was 72 when he passed. Most famous for playing Spock's daddy. And this hurts. Carl Sagan, beloved cosmologist and spokesman for the planet Earth, passed away very prematurely at the age of 62. Uh, Before we get into theaters, let's welcome the chat room. DJ, who's in the chat room? Okay, well, we have some of our regular folks returning. We thank you very much. We have our uh, our uh, honorable Rara uh, here. Aunt Tudor is in our crowd. Yay. I've got we've got my uh, my uh, other half forever after, or at least uh, for another thirty years, according to the mortgage company, uh, Billy Star Sage. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Billy. <laughs> Uh, we have the ever mysterious Cronehaven who may be lurking or playing a game. Uh, we have from the land down under, Mr. Archie Cruiser. 
joining us from tomorrow or is it yesterday no no he's uh in the future L locked heavily in the future he'll he knows all folks maybe he could tell us how everything turns out uh and uh, we've got mr tommy hash browns from the great white north and of course yours truly and my nerd brother mr smelly all right we give a round of applause for our returning patrons All right, tell us what was in the theaters along with my fellow Americans. All righty, so my fellow Americans. Well, Toppy and I were talking behind the curtain before the show, and usually films are timed for a, a release at a certain time of the year because maybe they uh, are relevant to maybe the holidays or summer. Those are usually the two biggest times that things are released. Well, this uh, was released in an election year. My fellow Americans, we were, it was kind of swept under the rug. It didn't get released until December. So no surprise. It was number 120. Uh, well, mm -hmm. they, that, uh, we're holding our record for uh, doing uh, the underdog movies, DJ. It, yeah, uh, my fellow Americans brought in twelve, a paltry twelve million. Right, uh, I'd be happy to have twelve million. <laughs> uh, wait, wait, wait! Do you hear what the number one movie made, folks? Oh goodness! Well, the number one film in '96 starred Will Smith and uh, my uh, my dad's hometown hero, Bill Pullman, in Independence Day, and it brought in more than a quarter of. Well, no, not a quarter of a million. A quarter of a billion is three hundred and six million. Mm -hmm. And I do think that was one of uh, Will Smith's first film roles outside of his sitcom days. Ooh, I don't know if we. He he had some movies under his belt. I think. Mm, well, this was at least the biggest one that we remember, anyway. Oh, that could be. And uh, number two that year was a little film with Helen Hunt where they're chasing some tornadoes. It was Twister, and that brought in two hundred and forty-one million. Now, who's the who? Who was the big other male lead in Twister? What was his name? I forget. Oh, I get him mixed up with Bill Pullman. I think it's Bill Paxton. Okay, I can always get those two names mixed up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I just remember my favorite scene in Twister was when they were um, feasting at the aunt's house, yeah. and it was mentioned that she slaughters her own beef. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of uh, secretly enjoy Twister. <laughs> <laughs> Number three in '96, uh, also the year I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. uh, whoa, whoa! Yes, uh, Mission Impossible. Not one of the sequels, of which there's been at least five or six, I think. But Mr. Tommy Cruz's first installment in Mission Impossible came out that year at a hundred and eighty million. Mm. Now, because we want to put things into perspective, because my, uh, my fellow Americans was not at the top of the box office. I want to give you an idea what was uh, in in uh, the neighborhood. So. One better than my fellow Americans at the box office was a little film that starred uh, TV's own Jonathan Taylor Thomas, JTT, who was on that show Home Improvement as one of the sons. He was in a version of Tom Finn and Huckle or a Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn called Tom and Huck made twelve point uh, six million. No memory of that whatsoever, but that uh, that kid actor. I, he yeah he would probably would have been pretty perfect in that mm. playing that probably he probably played Tom Sawyer I I would expect I would too and uh, one last then my fellow Americans was a film with one of my favorite Hispanic actresses she played a domestic on uh, a short lived series called I Married Dora where she married the boss to get a green card. Lone Star came out in 96 and had Elizabeth Pena, who we've sadly lost in more recent years. I don't think the, the poor lady even got to see 60, and uh, mm. it brought in 12.1 million. 
that year. Uh, no memory of that movie either. But oddly enough, I, I really don't have any memory of my fellow Americans coming out either. It was totally under my radar. Um, I did not see it when it came out. I, I don't remember it coming out. Um, did, um, so, yeah, uh, our, our movie tonight was uh, completely unknown to me until uh, you suggested it, DJ. Yeah, I didn't catch this when it came out to theaters either. I mean, uh, I've mentioned before that with as many kids in our house as we had, we often didn't see things until it was out on cassette or, you know, we might have been able to watch it in the winter when dad was allowed to have HBO. But uh, this is something I caught years later when I, I, I used to get a discount with my employer on some of the premium channels. So uh, I, I discovered this and I, I just wonder how it flew under my radar because these are some of the actors that my father enjoyed when I was growing up and he would always tune to Turner Classic Movies and say, oh, it's a movie with Lauren Bacall or Jack Lemmon. You've got to see this. Oh, yeah. Lauren Bacall, completely wasted in this movie. <laughs> uh just seriously you know why i mean honestly she had maybe six lines in the whole damn thing and uh pfft, i mean just completely wasted but anyways let's talk about the stars notably the two main stars jack lemon and james garner well jack lemon oh what a long career uh what a wonderful long career and uh, you know, many times the first thing that people think of with Jack Lemon is uh, his cross-dressing movie, uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, uh, with his co-star Tony Curtis. Both he and Tony Curtis <clears throat> uh, dressed as women uh, for some cockamamie re reason. And... Uh, Marilyn Monroe appeared uh, notably in the movie. A lot of people just, you know, that's sort of an iconic role. Um, you always see publicity shots of uh, Lemon and Curtis uh, dressed in drag for that. Um, but um, he was also, uh, as he was gaining, oh, some like it hot. Mm. Crownhaven corrected me, and that is exactly right. Uh, some like it hot, not gentlemen preferred ones. Thank you, Crownhaven. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, Lemon was, uh, it started like many um, doing uh, TV, and that was way early in the 50s. So he had a lot of appearances on TV. And his first, uh, one of his first leading roles in a movie was Three for the Road with Betty Grable. And then uh, he kind of hit it big, uh, became more well-known with Mr. Roberts with Henry Fonda and James Cagney. <clears throat> that was in 55. And then really made it big in one of those old all-time great movies, The Odd Couple. Yes, uh... The uh, Neil Simon uh, written uh, play that uh, became the movie, that became the TV series, The Odd Couple, and he co starred in that with Walter Matthau. And, uh, you know, who can forget Jack Lemon clearing his sinuses? Stop! Stop! Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Uh, and, um, uh, he uh, had a great uh, popularity after that. Now, uh, he is uh, known to have extended his career, um, not only in this movie, um, My Fellow Americans, but he was doing a lot of roles late in life, and one of them reunited him with Walter Matthau, and that was Grumpy Old Men and 93 with Anne Margaret. That was a sequel, Grumpy Your Old Man. You know who gave me a big laugh <clears throat> in those movies was um, uh, the father. Uh, uh, I think Jack Lemmon. Oh, goodness. Who was the character? Actor? He played the penguin on Batman. What uh, Burgess Meredith. Oh, yes. Uh, he uh, 
he had uh yeah, he made me laugh in that movie. Um oh yeah, bacon sandwiches. Yeah, I, I it was they were pretty good. I think the the first one I, I think much better better than Grumpy or Old Man the sequel. And he appeared in many more films uh as he was getting older <clears throat> and uh and sadly passed away in two thousand and one. And uh, DJ, his uh, his co-star James Garner, tells about him. Okay, well, we actually are uh, getting to about our halfway mark in the show, so we are going to trot on over here to our concession stand. Yes, yeah, step right up. I got lots of candy and garbage. Oh, now uh, don't try passing off any of that leftover Halloween candy, Missy. Ah. We're on to you. So uh, for your listening enjoyment, we have a little feature here, and it's going to uh, cover some of the material of uh, Lauren McCall's appearances over the years on the Larry King Show. And this was done in her memory just after her passing. Uh, well, it's been a few years now, but uh, Lauren McCall and Larry King. You just put your lips together and blow. Did you see yourself the way you were described? Did you see yourself as sultry, sexual? No. You did no. not. You were a little Jewish girl from New York. How did Those you see never yourself? Change. I don't see myself. I don't understand that kind of thing. I don't think that way. I really do have not put myself in a category. God knows enough other people put us all in categories, and I hate that. I just. I was playing a game, you know, it's play acting. Anyway, when you're a kid and you're starting, and I was very young, and I just, uh, I don't think of myself as anything I would like to be thought of as an actress. That's all I ever wanted to be thought of as, as a yeah. good one. Next thing you've got to remember is that a gentleman you meet among the cold cuts is simply not as attractive as one that you meet, say, in the meat department at Bird Dogs. I try not to look too closely, actually, because it doesn't interest me to go back into the past. I, I really don't live in the past at all. And I, um, I just think that I've had a very lucky life in many ways, and I've had a hard life in some ways, and I've had a very up and down life. It has certainly not been on an even keel at all. You have no intention of not working. You are correct. Why? I love to work. And I, I look, I live alone. New I York? have three in New York. I have three grown children who have their own lives. I have got to have a life of my own. I Are cannot depend on my children. Yes, but I am not your typical one. I do not babysit. Not my <laughs> you don't, you no. don't do windows. No, I don't do windows. <laughs> you don't I babysit? You them. don't take the little ones no. home and diaper them? No. Please. I've done that with my own three so, kids. So forget it. I was not that. put on earth for that. Are you a good mother-in-law? I, I love them. I don't know. I hope so. I mean, that's not a, that's you not don't a, it's not a profession. Oh, I interfere sometimes because <laughs> I have opinions, as you may have noticed. So you want to keep on working. But I have to keep on working because I love to work. And I think one must use oneself. And I, it keeps my brain going. It keeps me physically functioning and trying to keep in some kind of shape. And it's what I, what I train to do. And I don't believe in retiring. It's an awful thing to do to a woman my age. Leave her alone with her thoughts. Like legend. I mean, I, I don't like the category, and I don't... I'm, to begin with, to me, a legend is something that is not on the earth, that is dead. You have to be dead gone. to be a legend. I think so. Because legends are built and evolved in the past. They're not the present. And I, I don't like categories either, in any event. I prefer individual... I mean, if people have respect for you or admire your work or whatever... I mean, I, you know, it's it's like they say, this one is the second Garbo, that one is the second Bogart, this is the second. There are no seconds. You are what you are. Everyone is an individual. How about the term living legend? I don't like legend, Larry. No matter what, living I legend. I don't like legend. I don't know what it means. What it's part of your life, of a star's life, is my business? What I, I think my work is your business. And I think perhaps what I do in public but nothing that I do in private is your business. Nothing. Nothing. We have no protection, it seems to me, in this country when it comes to invasion of privacy. Yeah, it's open sesame. 
And I think that is a horror. And you are an angel. And you're That's almost good. one. <laughs> and we are back. <laughs> DJ, this is my king. Uh, DJ, I'm curious. Uh, what is the... Oh, never mind. I'm just trying to do my... <laughs> oh my god what a hack interviewer i'm sorry i was never <laughs> fond of larry king oh well i figured we'd give the uh the lady of the film another moment because as you said she was so briefly in there but she was a breath of fresh air so. well she, she was classy and my favorite uh movie she was in uh uh is uh Lauren Bacall is a uh, Key Largo. Love that movie. Oh my God, Key Largo! Uh, you guys have got to see it. It's got so many iconic performances in it by uh, some really great actors. Anyways, um, were we about to talk about James Garner? I think so. We sure were. So, uh, Mr. Lemons, uh, cope star in my fellow americans was uh oh sort of a last minute replacement uh toppy could you uh clue us in on that what happened who was supposed to be in this movie well it may not surprise you when you hear but uh, walter Matthau was originally oh. uh going to be teamed once again with jack lemon uh, i think well i think you can imagine um how kind of great that would have been although i think james garner was just fine in this movie and paired off really well with lemon but you can just i mean that it was just written for walter Matthau and jack lemon to do by the way uh just uh, uh originally when this movie was further back in planning stages it was written for younger actors and uh, so originally, Kramer and Douglas were going to be portrayed by Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. Hmm. Um, and that would have reunited those two actors um, who starred in Hook in 1991. Uh, but uh, why that never exactly happened, why they went and cast older, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, there you go. Well, uh, so Mr. James Garner, and I'm actually glad that he landed in this role because I find it refreshing. I mean, yes, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon had chemistry, but this gave you a chance to see Jack Lemmon opposite someone else. And, you know, he still had the gusto. Uh, Mr. James Garner was born in the heartland. He was born in Oklahoma. His first break was in Toward the Unknown, a film from 56 with William Holden. Then Garner landed a TV role with Jack Kelly and uh, it ran for about five years. A series called Maverick, where he played uh, a gambling man in the, in the West. And in the decade that would follow, Garner would appear in nearly two dozen films, 24. Yes. Returning to TV in yes. the well-known Rockford. Uh, unf <laughs> Unfortunately, many of those movies were 60s comedies. And I'm sorry, but the 60s was a horrible decade for comedies <laughs> it just was it just was but anyways i interrupt go ahead that's okay so the rockford files lasted oh about six seasons and in the two years just before my fellow americans 96 to get you back on track garner would appear in what would become a total of six television movies continuing the characters from the Rockford Files. Wow, I have no memory of that. He got a lot of mileage out of that character, that's for sure. Yeah, and, um, you know, uh, later on, before his passing, he was on a couple of seasons of a, uh, a TV series with the Married with Children's Katie Seagal called Eight Simple Rules which was originally eight simple rules for dating my daughter. I don't know why they shortened the name, I don't know. but uh, the, it originally starred John Ritter. And of course he passed away in the second season. James Garner was brought in to play that character's father. Mm -hmm. There you go. Aunt Tudor just posted a, 
Um, you know, James Garner in I'm pretty sure is a a photo from his character as James Rockford. Um uh, he, James Garner was one of those actors, sort of like Spencer Tracy and, and many others, who just never seemed to be acting. I mean, and everything seemed effortless. Um, uh, so I guess I'm saying I, I liked him and he was good. Um, <laughs> um, so another character uh, or actor uh, in this movie was Jan Dan Aykroyd. And, of course, he had a long career on Saturday Night Live and in many comedies, some inspired by Saturday Night Live. Um, also one directed by Peter Siegel, the director of My Fellow Americans. That was Tommy Boy. But Dan Aykroyd, you know, I, I kind of um, uh, like what he did with his career um, after, you know, his big blockbusters like uh, Ghostbusters, for example, mm -hmm. um, and he, he just uh, did character roles, and and he didn't mind like he, they weren't lead roles. Uh, I'm thinking of Driving Miss Daisy, just for oh, yes. example, where he was just wonderful as um, as the old lady's uh, son uh, trying to look after. Uh, and so he did a lot of roles like this. And I don't know. He's not memorable in this movie. And he really isn't given a hell of a lot to do. But it's, you know, it is another very supporting role um, that he's doing here. Um, and so, yeah, let's, uh, we don't have much to say about Peter Siegel. But uh, he's the director. But he's uh, he did Tommy Boy, like we said. He did Anger Management, and he did he did a movie version of Get Smart. Uh, I wonder which one he did because if you can believe it, there were two movie versions of Get Smart. Well, I don't know how that happened, but there were. Huh. Well, I know that uh, the one that Peter Sigal did was. Um, the one starring Steve Carell and Anne Hathaway. Oh, that one. Okay. I thought maybe it was one that actually had Don Adams in it. Oh, no, no. This was much more recently, although looking back now, it's probably been 10 or 15 years. And yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I really enjoyed the newer Get Smart film that was done with Steve Carell. I think that they dropped the ball that there should have been a sequel because uh, there was pretty good chemistry between Steve Carell and Anne Hathaway. And Anne Hathaway did a bang-up job of trying to be 99. Yeah. Um, and if anyone wants a laugh, um, they did try to revive Get Smart with Don Adams when he was still alive for the movies. Uh, and they're just so wonderfully awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh so i i don't even remember what they're called I, I i i don't i don't think it was just get smart it was like get smart returns or i don't know what it was but or get smarter i think maybe but. oh get smarter yeah that could be um i just remember that in the 90s after i had seen many of the of course reruns of get smart my dad was very keen on a show, and I, I forget what station it was on, that featured Don Adams, who was a manager of a supermarket, and this show was called Check It Out. And it was a sitcom? It was. <laughs> Man. <laughs> you know, Don Adams um, <clears throat> is one, uh, none of the one of those actors that he, he really started out doing stand-up comedy. That's how he started. Why are we talking about Don Adams? I've totally forgotten why we're talking about Don oh, Adams. We, we got sidetracked by talking about the director, Mr. Peter Seagal, who oh, did yeah. a smart remake. Now, also, somebody else in the cast that I didn't mention here is Mr. Bradley Whitford. And he plays one of the, uh, the uh, men in this film who is involved with the scandal. Now, as, as was mentioned in the trailer, and uh, Gertie mentioned it, these two former presidents have been uh, implicated in a scandal that took place in the White House. And of course, they have to team up 
to uh, to get the evidence to prove that neither of them was involved. And of course, the calamity of that is what uh, transpires throughout the course of this movie. But Bradley Whitford played uh, one of the, the men involved in the scandal. And some of you might recognize him from the early days of his career. He was in Animal House. He was one of the fraternity brothers. And then a few years after My Fellow Americans, he was in one of my favorite NBC sitcoms starring, of all people, Martin Sheen. And it was a government-themed series called The West Wing. And uh, he played the deputy communications officer, uh, Josh Lyman. And um, his fans were called uh, Lemon Lymans. (laughs) Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of the other stars was John Hurt, um, who's never been a leading man and has been in many supporting roles. If you saw his face, you'd say, Oh yeah. I, I, I remember him as being the dad on Home Alone. Uh, he, I don't remember that, but I, I I just don't remember who played the father, but I'll, it could be. <laughs> By the way, Ann Tudor just posted a photo of James Garner, much younger. Uh, you know, he had that uh, those leading man good looks. I mean, he was a very, uh, very good looking guy. Cronhaven says uh, that she just saw Garner in a Doris Day movie the other night. And she says it was very forgettable. It was called The Thrill of It All. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean, Cronaven. The 60s, oh, I don't know why. They just couldn't do a comedy worth beans in the 60s. What was wrong? (laughs) I don't know. Um, Actually, the weird thing about the 60s is is it was the dying embers of the studio system. And and there were, um, I think the reason so many of the movies of the late 60s in particular, just seems so old-fashioned. We did one of them right here in the show, DJ. Mm-hmm. Um, with, well, wasn't it Doris Day? Uh, oh, yes. Caprice. Uh, Caprice, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> that is the kind of 60s comedy that they just... I, I, but the problem was that uh, young the, the younger uh, uh, creators had moved into Hollywood and were doing truly groundbreaking things uh, that were just so, well, modern at the time that all of these old style movies just looked ancient. You know, the day they were uh, put out into the theaters, they ju- they just seemed ancient. Uh, consider, you know... Um, Oh, uh, well, I'm I'm brain farting with the the name, but uh, the Dustin Hoffman, his first movie there with Anne Bancroft. Was that are you, oh, well, the Bachelor? No, or, no, no, grad, no. the Graduate. The, thank you, the Graduate. I mean, uh, the Graduate's example of of, of, of uh, a movie created by these young uh, creative people. <laughs> And uh, the, uh, there's, I mean, then you think of Caprice, what was that was done, of, you know, mm-hmm. practically the same time, and they are miles and miles apart. Um, but I do have a, you know, I have, you know, we loved Caprice, and and I like all of Doris Day's uh, pillow talk comedies. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's talk about um, what was going on. In our movie tonight. Sure. Now, well, before we talk about our favorite moments, our moments you shouldn't miss, I'd like to just play another clip from the film. Oh, you know, yeah. I'll give you the uh, choice on this topic. We can either uh, have a sampling of the chemistry between uh, Jack Lemon and Lauren Bacall or between uh, Jack Lemon and James Garner. I'll do the James Garner and Jack Lemon. Okay. So, this is uh, once the, uh, the scandal has been revealed. And the presidents are on the lam trying to uh, get from point A to point B without being picked up by the NSA. What do you miss most about the office? I don't miss anything. I don't live in the past. 
But Rita, what about Rita? Oh, God, Rita, yes, I do miss Rita. The greatest cook the White House ever had. The only cook the White House ever had. I think Rita started with George Washington. Yeah. You know, when I couldn't sleep, I'd go downstairs and she'd make this dessert. It was a cream puff with raspberry sauce. In the boy, I don't know. Did you ever have one of her pizzas? It was like a wet dream with a crust. A wet dream? Huh? I don't think I need to hear Russell P. Kramer saying the words wet dream. I'll wake up screaming every night till I die. There's nothing wrong with wet dreams. Stop. I had a couple when I was a kid. Great. I'll look for that exhibit in your library. Just stop. <laughs> also, don't say wet dream and okay, cry. Okay, I got one. Oh. When you were in the White House, who was the person you were most excited to meet? Nelson Mandela. I'm not a reporter. Ella Fitzgerald. Uh. Mandela was a great man, but he couldn't sing worth shit. Oh, that was a thrill. Uh, so that was the movie, right what? there, folks. Oh, uh, I could go on, but so could I. Know. Play, <laughs> play it out. I, I, I kept thinking it was ending. Play it out. Okay. Let me see if I can get to that. Uh, I don't know if you'll let me to it. About the office. Uh, uh, is there anything? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, anyways, we're about to bond, and that'll make me vomit. All right. There you go. Okay. Um, so that was pretty much the movie where the quips that Garner and uh, Lemon would, would trade. You know, the whole story about why they got into this whole mess didn't really matter at all. In fact, it was so garbled. I even took a second look at the damn beginning of this movie to try and see if I could figure the freaking plot out and i think i guess i think i got it a little better but it was still so convoluted um but it it, it doesn't really matter all we know is that uh, the, the that the two of them are uh, pushed into circumstances beyond their control and the uh, the comedy and hijinks ensued and the reasons why and how aren't all that important um but they didn't really do a good job in uh, helping us understand what it was all about. It was pretty convoluted. But once it gets going and they're on the road and they're uh, on the run, um, what happens is the two of them meet, well, many different Americans. And, um, and uh, that is a lot of the story there what uh, you know they 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 let's you know let's go over the kinds of americans they meet mm -hmm. i think the first one for example is the independent woman trucker right right mm -hmm. so she represents a, a faction what were some of the others do you remember well of course she was uh harboring uh farm equipment which ended up being immigrants there you go uh, so we have a, 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 a an immigrant character that has a, a brief interaction. The poor guy. By the way, remember when he was running off with the in the trench coat? Mm -hmm. um, and I I suddenly thought, oh my god, they're going to shoot him. Right. And I thought, oh, this is going to ruin the movie for me if they mm -hmm. shoot this guy. Well, he they didn't shoot him, and he got away. And he even comes back at the end of the movie. But um, so, yeah, there's the immigrant issue. She was hiding. The woman trucker was hiding uh, immigrants coming across the border, um, you know, which is uh, an issue that's only gotten more and more complex um, and insinuous uh, as the years have gone on. Uh, you know, it's it's despicable what, what's going on now. But it was an issue way back then in 96. Um, there were the uh, the couple camping. Right. The middle America, you know, they lost their jobs and their home. And they, they, of course, end up explaining that through their interactions there because the the uh, the presidents uh, forgetting themselves don't realize they're overstepping their bounds when they're being provided free transportation by the family and they're correcting the family when they're trying <laughs> to point out historical events to their child. That's what it was. That was pretty funny. Um, so they get mixed up. Antruder just posted a photo here. Um, <laughs> they um, sort of stumble upon a gay pride parade that they don't know is a gay pride parade until Garner figures it out. Uh, and, and Garner is asked, oh, are you coming out? And he says, no, not me. It's 
the other guy. Jack oh, Lemmon. and and they end up having an all Dorothy marching band for you know from the Wizard of Oz. Right. Uh, so there's um, some minority um, action in there. What what else were there? Well, any- they also ran into many people working in different businesses, like the attendants at the gas station, and. Okay. Um, you know, they went through a drive through at one point and, right. uh, you know, um, it, it, it was just funny because uh, one of my favorite scenes takes place at that drive in where they uh, they've run out of money. You know, their they, their wallets were stolen and things. And, uh, you know, he's uh, drinking his coffee and he's he, uh, Jack Lemon goes to share it with James Garner. He says, oh, this is decaf. He goes, you want to lick the lid? And he's like, oh, sure. I'm going to share my coffee with the Washington love machine. <laughs> <laughs> and then James Garner does lick the lid. He's so he wants coffee so bad. Uh, I'll tell you the one uh, area I think they copped out. I'm not sure why. I They took the easy road, uh, but that was African-Americans. Uh, they did not include a scene, um, and they certainly could have. They had every opportunity to lampoon that, but they didn't. Instead, they simply reminisced about the White House cook, who was Esther Roll, yeah, and how you know how she was so wonderful and cooked great things, and they loved her, and then she comes in uh she's in some of the scenes in the latter part where she's sort of i don't know she's she's bailed them out and she's feeding them all of her old treats but it was a bit of a cop out um because the one african-american character is just already beloved and uh you know apparently they just they did not want to go there apparently yeah. Now, one thing that uh, is part of this story, and it's kind of an undertone, and I could understand where a more modern audience, somebody maybe of a, a younger generation, may not get some of the subtleties in this film, because this came out in 96. And, of course, we find okay. out... And by the way, there are not many subtleties <laughs> in this movie, but go ahead. <laughs> we find out later on that one of the Secret Service men who are there to protect the president's past and present was one of the gay men who was marching in the Pride Parade. Yeah, he's actually in that photo that Aunt Tudor. He's one of the Dorothys. Yes, and uh, in the 90s, President Clinton introduced a policy that there's still mixed opinions on don't ask, don't tell. So, of course, someone from a later generation wouldn't understand that the Secret Service agent really had to be careful in that time because he couldn't reveal, you know, his his uh, his, you know, lifestyle and still keep his job then. Right, right. So they did, you know, they did, they certainly did much better dealing with um, LBGT issues than they did African American issues in the movie. And I, I just think it was, it was easier to find the comedy in the LBGT thing. Um, anyways, um, we're about out of time, believe it or not. And uh, uh, I will, I'll just give you one teeny nugget of uh, useless knowledge because that's what we specialize here in the minutia. No. So the actor who played the Secret Service agent, who was also in the Pride Parade, was uh, one Jeff Yeager. And uh, somebody who is uh, into completely useless knowledge would recognize him from a film done around this time. We had Lindsay Wagner and Lee Majors, The Bionic Showdown, and it also starred Sandra Bullock, who sometimes actually leaves that film off of her resume. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she was the new Bionic girl. And um, anyways, Jeff Yeager plays her character's boyfriend in a uh, not very often seen film called Bionic Showdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, Deborah Winger... Uh... <laughs> Did a similar turn as uh, uh, Wonder Girl on the Wonder Woman TV show. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. and I have a feeling that uh, she probably leaves that off her resume too. 
<laughs> By the way, I think it's kind of funny um, that uh, President Russell Kramer by Jack Lemmon in this movie um, uh, kept himself busy writing books. And uh, I just had a laugh at, at the titles of his books. One was Hail to the Chief. Uh, one was Read My Tulips. Jesus. <laughs> and uh, one was uh, Executive Obedience. Learn from the Master. Oh, I so. think your your glasses might have a smudge there, Top, because my copy says Hail to the Chef. Oh, you're right. I misread it. Hail to the <laughs> Chef, which I guess was yeah. Esther Rowe. Right. Well, of course, I think that that's tongue in cheek because one of the uh, moments in the film was uh, James Garner's character, um, you know, admonishing him for writing a cookbook. And he says, uh, did William Howard Taft write, you know, 30 days to a slimmer behind? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. we are at the point where we're going to tell you something else you might enjoy if you liked my fellow Americans. So, Toppy, I'll let you go first. First, here, what do you think our listeners might enjoy if they liked my fellow American? Well, I think possibly you might enjoy being there from 1979, um, a much more cerebral comedy, much more sophisticated than um, my fellow Americans could ever hope to be, is a movie with Peter Sellers, Shirley MacLaine, Melvin Douglas. Jack Warden and uh, Peter Sellers plays like the simple minded gardener. He is what he is. He's uh, he's been sheltered his entire life and he becomes just coincidentally involved in Washington politics and uh, a similar. You know, it's an opportunity for the filmmakers to make comedy uh, and um, ironic points about Washington politics in a, in a way that's just as funny, if, if not funnier, but also far more sophisticated than our movie tonight. So I'd, I'd recommend being there. And what year did that come out? 1979. Okay, so uh, in the vein of the 90s, a little earlier than my fellow Americans, it's another film that uh, includes a storyline set at the White House. Now, this is something that came out in 93 and uh, has every fav every horror and sci-fi's favorite uh, actress, Sigourney Weaver. She's playing the first lady in this film with Kevin Klein. This is a film called Dave. And uh, it also has Charles Grodin in it as the best friend. But basically, um, it's a storyline that involves a, uh, a president who has a lookalike. And the lookalike's from a small town. And, well, before the film is uh, too far in, the lookalike gets to uh, take the president's place while some things go on there so um take a look at dave from 1993 it's got a bunch of laughs in it there's even a scene where kevin klein's character sneaks out with the first lady for a night on the town and when they're confronted by a member of the public they present themselves as impersonators Ah, uh, okay. In interesting. I think I may have seen at least part of it. Um, I like Kevin Klein. Uh, you know, oddly enough, Sigourney Weaver, in any comedy she's ever been, I just never, I don't, I couldn't tell you why, I never bought her as a comedic actress. I never believed her. I never thought she was funny, except possibly she was in a movie with uh, Harrison Ford and <laughs> Crone said, Crone Haven just typed in, I like to watch. It's just a line from Peter <laughs> Sellers in uh, being there. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, Sigourney Weaver in comedic roles, just never, I mean, seriously, I, 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 I never liked her in comedies. <laughs> anyways, that's just a... I don't even know why I'm talking about that. But anyways, oh, that's all right. We're going to move out here to the lobby because it's almost time to say goodbye. And uh, 
I do believe that there's a bit of magic involved with our store here tonight, Toppy. Could you grab me that bag of coins the magician left behind? All right, here you go. All right, put that in the slot. Okay, so the <laughs> next time we get together is in two weeks because we do this on the first and third Friday of the month. And the next one is going to be pretty close to Turkey Day for those of us in uh, the USA. So Friday, November 20th, what do you got there, sir? All right, in the capsule, dispense from the magic uh, gumball machine. <laughs> is a uh, our next uh, movie. It's a late 60s, oh God, a late 60s comedy. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> and uh, although this one's very different, folks, because this is a movie that was made by some of the new young kids that came into Hollywood. So it was very hip. Uh, when you hear what it is, you'll know. Uh, it's about when one man is asked to take out the trash and it ends up with his arrest. And that arrest keeps him from joining the army while so many of his friends are being sent to Vietnam. Patricia Quinn is in it. So is James Broderick and Arlo Guthrie. The movie is Alice's Restaurant. And this is an obscure uh, late 60s comedy drama that is Based on Arlo Guthrie's long song, Alice's Restaurant. And uh, that is our next movie. Okay, our Thanksgiving-ish story. Already, Toppy, it has been a thin slice of heaven, sir, and uh, we have actually... Thin slice of heaven. <laughs> 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 oh, I've never been given a better compliment. Oh, and, uh, you know, it's it's certainly been a, a summerish fall day, so, uh, you know, while the getting's good, we'll uh, walk out the aisle here, sir. So if you would, please do, do the honors. Say goodnight, Gracie. Nah, goodnight, Gracie. Thank you for listening to Matinee Minutia. Our show streams live the first and third Friday of each month. Go to univazpods.net, click the tower for audio, enter Discord for chat. You can find the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Tweet us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Join our Facebook group. Visit our webpage at matineeminutia.com. Have an idea for a future show? Or just want to message us? Email us at matineeminutia at gmail.com. Oliver. This has been an Ollie Bug production. I have a voice. I have a voice. You have a voice. You have a voice. We have a voice. We have a voice. Unique voices in podcasting. Univazpods.net. Okay, I am stopping the stream. And I will go ahead and turn off the broadcast. <laughs>